So let's suppose some particular protein found inside our cell needs to be broken down into its constituent amino acids. Why? Well, let's suppose it was damaged. How exactly does the cell know to break down that particular protein that was damaged and leave all the other normal proteins untouched? Well, the answer lies in a 76 amino acid polypeptide known as ubiquitin. So ubiquitin is this marker for those proteins that need to be broken down. And before the protein is actually broken down, it undergoes a process known as ubiquitination. That is, we attach many ubiquitin molecules onto that target protein that needs to be broken down. Now let's take a look at the following diagram. So let's suppose this is our ubiquitin molecule, that 76 amino acid polypeptide chain. Now on the carboxylate end of that particular molecule, we have a glycine residue, a glycine amino acid. And it's this glycine amino acid that is found on the carboxylate end of that ubiquitin that is actually attached onto that target protein that needs to be broken down. And it's the lysine residues on the target protein that are, that are used to actually generate a bond to attach the ubiquitin to that target protein. So let's suppose this is our target protein and this here is the side chain group of a lysine residue of a lysine amino acid. So we use this nitrogen on the lysine side chain group to form a bond between this nitrogen and this, carbux, uh, and this carbon. And and this bond here is known as the isopeptide bond. So the carboxyl terminal group of the ubiquitin is extended and it contains a glycine residue. And it's this glycine residue that is covalently attached onto the epsilon amino group of lysine residues found on target proteins. And this bond is known as the isopeptide bond. Now, as we'll see in just, a, uh, in just a moment, the formation of this isopeptide bond is carried out by the hydrolysis of an ATP molecule. So we have to hydrolyze an ATP molecule to actually gain enough energy to carry out this process by which we attach a ubiquitin onto that target protein. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the process by which we attach ubiquitin onto the target protein. Now, this process of ubiquitination actually involves three different enzymes and three different processes. So enzyme number one, or step number one, basically utilize the enzyme we call ubiquitin activating enzyme. And what this enzyme ultimately does is it harvests the energy that is released when we hydrolyze ATP and utilize that energy to actually activate that ubiquitin molecule. And that prepares the ubiquitin. It gives it enough energy to actually attach it ultimately onto that target protein. So the first step is catalyzed by ubiquitin activating enzyme or E1 and this is catalyzed via the hydrolysis of ATP and the carboxyl end of ubiquitin is essentially linked to the enzyme via a thioester bond. So on enzyme number one, on enzyme one E1, we have a cysteine and the side chain of that cysteine is used to attach that ubiquitin molecule. So let's take a look at the following diagram to see exactly what we mean. So we have our ubiquitin in its non-active form. So in step one, we take an ATP molecule and we essentially transfer an AMP from the ATP onto the ubiquitin and we release a pyrophosphate. So we see that the product of this particular reaction is an active ubiquitin molecule that contains this AMP group. And so now it's a high energy molecule. We release the pyrophosphate and now E1, this enzyme, the ubiquitin activating enzyme, basically catalyzes the transfer of this blue region onto the active side of E1. So we see that the active side contains a cysteine and this is the S 
uh, the, uh, the S atom that is part of the side chain group of the cysteine and it attaches onto the carbon of this ubiquitin molecule. And so we see that this AMP is released in the process. So this is ultimately step number one that we have here. Now, step number two is catalyzed by an enzyme we call the ubiquitin conjugated enzyme, conjugating enzyme, or E2. And what this enzyme ultimately does is, is it transfers that ubiquitin from the enzyme E1 onto the enzyme E2. So just like the enzyme E1 contains this sulfhydryl group in the active site, enzyme 2 also contains a cysteine residue that contains that sulfhydryl group. And so we simply have a shuttling, a transferring of the ubiquitin from enzyme 1 to enzyme 2. So we see that the activated version of ubiquitin that we formed in step number one is now transferred onto the second enzyme by attaching it onto the cysteine residue of enzyme 2, E2. Now in the final step, this is basically what happens. So we have the final enzyme E3, which is known as the ubiquitin protein ligase, basically enters the picture. And now what it does is, is it transfers the ubiquitin group onto this protein target here. So let's suppose this is the target protein that we actually want to break down into its constituent amino acids. And let's suppose this is the residue of the lysine amino acid that we're about to add that ubiquitin molecule to. So ultimately, this carbon here forms a bond with this nitrogen and we form this final product molecule. At the same time, E2 and enzyme E3 basically depart and we form this final product. Now, this is not actually the final step of this reaction. In order to actually target that particular protein for degradation, we have to actually add many more ubiquitin molecules. In fact, we have to add at least four ubiquitin molecules to actually target that protein for degradation. And the way the ubiquitin is added is in a processive manner. And what that means is, once we attach that ubiquitin, onto this protein, we actually attach more ubiquitin molecules onto this ubiquitin. So once with this process happens, if we examine ubiquitin, the 48th residue of ubiquitin is a lysine. And that lysine is used in the same way that we use the lysine of this target protein to basically attach a second ubiquitin molecule in this same fashion here. So if we study the structure of ubiquitin, ubiquitin at, at its 48th position will have a lysine and that lysine will contain this nitrogen atom that will be able to form a bond in the same fashion that we show here. And so we'll form an isopeptide bond and we'll attach a second ubiquitin, then a third ubiquitin, a fourth ubiquitin, and at that point we target that protein for degradation. But this process can happen many more times than just four times. And in fact, this process happens on different lysine residues on that target protein. So essentially, once we undergo the process of ubiquitination, it's then that we can actually target that particular protein for breakdown. And it's then that the proteasome complex actually finds that particular protein and begins to break it down, and begins to break it down into its constituent amino acids.